Welcome to AP Biology Unit 5, Heredity. We are halfway through the AP Biology curriculum, so here we go. This first video is going to focus on just an introduction to heredity, as well as the process of meiosis. So to start with an introduction of heredity, let's just start with the basics. What is heredity? Take a look at this uh, picture of the giraffes and see if that can help inspire you to answer this question. Heredity is simply the transmission of traits from one generation to the next. Which leads to the next obvious question, what is a trait? And then again, let's use these giraffes as inspiration. What are two traits that you might see in these giraffes? A trait is a specific characteristic of an organism. Traits can be anatomical, physiological, or behavioral. Traits generally fall into three major categories, which is anatomical, physiological, or behavioral. So when we're looking at these giraffes, we could look at anatomical characteristics, like the way it's built, the way it looks, physiological characteristics, the way it's uh, sort of its inner workings, right? Like how all of those anatomical pieces actually function, as well as behavioral. So on a bigger scale, um, how does that individual sort of navigate through its life? So for example, you can see the way that it's drinking water relates to a behavior. Um, but this actually relates to anatomy and physiology of the giraffe because it is so tall, its head is so far above its heart that it needs to have um, so much blood pumping from its heart that if it just bent its head straight over, the capillaries in its head would explode. So in this case, anat anatomy, physiology, and behavior are all kind of working in tandem. But you could talk about all of the separate traits that relate to that. Uh, just a side note, phenotype and trait are often used um, synonymously, um, but you can also talk about a phenotype as a combination of several traits. So let's talk a little bit more about phenotype, or more specifically, phenotypic diversity. Phenotypic diversity is the variability you see in phenotypes. So when you look at a population, um, how do they differ? How do they differ in terms of anatomy, physiology, and behavior? Let's look at an example. C. elegans is a nematode pictured here. It's a roundworm, and it's a model organism, so it's well understood by scientists, well studied. Um, it's usually about a millimeter long, really small, um, but adults do vary somewhat in body size. So let's try to think through what might be some factors that lead to two adult nematodes being different sizes. Very simply, uh, different phenotypes can be different due to differences in genotype, in the genes, differences in the environment, or most common, a combination. Let's do a little graphing exercise and see if you could um, come up with a way of expressing a trait that might be um, that the difference between different individuals is due to um, one of these four scenarios. So in the first one, let's try to graph um, what this situation would look like if there's no variation in body size. So all um, adult nematodes have the same phenotype. The second case, what if the phenotypic variation is only due to variation in genes? The third one, variation is due only to the environment. And the fourth one, variation is due to an interaction between them. So get out a piece of paper, see if you can draw these graphs. Now there are actually lots of correct answers here, but let's look at the um, sort of core concept. If we're looking at no variation in body size, you should just have one body size, and that's why it's that straight line there. So with both of our genotypes, represented by our red line and our black line, they are identical. Um, but beyond that, they also are identical across different environments. So in this case, the environment we're looking at is temperature. So there's no change due to environment. There's no change due to genotype. The next one, where we have phenotypic variation due to variation in genes only, we do see a difference between different nematodes, but in this case, temperature doesn't matter, right? The environment has no effect. The only reason that those two, um, that individuals might be different is because they have different genotypes. The third one, phenotypic variation, is due to variation in the environment only. Here, once again, our two genotypes are identical, but now we see that there is a variation in body size, and that's because of temperature. So in this case, we've demonstrated that um, in cold temperatures, they're smaller. That's not really the main point here. The point is looking at the relationship between these variables, um, not the specifics of it. And that last one is uh, phenotypic variation is due to an interaction of genes and environment, which means yes, genotype has an effect. Yes, 
the environment has an effect, but they have um, different effects. So, for example, the environment affects those two genotypes differently. This is actually the most common. Most traits um, display this, where there's an interaction between genes and environment. But because we want to keep things simple, um, we're primarily going to focus in this unit on phenotypic variation that is due to genes. The last point I want to make while we're still talking about the introduction to this unit is comparing asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. In this unit, we're going to be focusing primarily on sexual reproduction, but I just want to make sure that you're aware that's not the only way of going. It's not the only way of making more organisms. And we're a little bit um, biased because humans uh, reproduce sexually, so that's sort of what we um, sort of assume is the standard, um, but there really are pros and cons both ways. So um, asexual reproduction, some of the advantages is that offspring are already adapted for their environment. There's no need to find a mate, which takes extra energy because all of the offspring are just clones of the parent. So um, if the parent is successful, then the child will probably be successful as well, as long as there's not too much change in the environment. Another advantage is that it's a really fast way of reproduction, although this can have negative side effects um, in terms of overpopulation. Um, and finally, one disadvantage of asexual reproduction is that all offspring, again, are clones, which means that if the environment is not good for one of those um, offspring, it's not going to be good for any of the offspring. If one gets sick, they all get sick. So if we have um, asexual reproduction, we generally have less diversity. And this is one of the major advantages of sexual reproduction, but it does come with sort of the flip side um, of some of those negatives. It takes extra energy, it's complicated. Um, down below here, we have um, a little diagram of several forms of asexual reproduction. You don't need to memorize these different types, just be aware there are different methods of asexual reproduction. All right, so now let's dive into Unit 5.1, which is focusing on meiosis. Um, in Unit 5.2, we're going to learn about how meiosis increases genetic diversity, specifically through independent assortment and recombination. Um, but in this unit, we're just going to get some basics about genetics and meiosis. So to get some basics on genetics and meiosis, let's start at the beginning and make sure you understand um, the terms gene, locus, allele, chromosome, and homologous. There are certainly many correct paragraphs you could have written, including all of these terms. Um, but the one I wrote relates to um, the homologous chromosomes pictured here. So to the right is a model of a set of paired chromosomes. Chromosomes are made of DNA and associated proteins, and they carry the genetic information. So each chromosome contains multiple genes. And a gene is that part of the chromosome that serves as the basic unit of heredity. So this is how information, how traits are passed on from one generation to the next. Genes influence many of an individual's characteristics. A locus is the location of the gene. Homologous chromosomes have the same genes in the same places along their length. So we can see that in the um, chromosomes pictured on the right. We'll come back to that in a second. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes for 46 total chromosomes. For each pair of chromosomes, one comes from the egg and one comes from the sperm. So um, humans are diploid, which means that we have two copies of um, each piece of information. So one from the egg, one from the sperm. So while both of these homologous chromosomes have the same genes, they have different forms of those genes. So if we look at the example on the right here, um, the individual has one form of what we're calling the dimple gene, and one codes for dimples and one codes for the absence of dimples. So we can see that at locus 2, which tells us where on the chromosome it is, and you'll notice that gene is in the same location on both of those chromosomes. I've colored it differently to represent that it's slightly different information, like the nucleotide sequence is slightly different on those two chromosomes, which means there's going to have slightly different information on both of those. Different forms of the same gene are called alleles. Now that we have a little background on chromosomes and genes, let's talk about the processes of mitosis and meiosis. Now mitosis we talked about in a previous unit, but meiosis we haven't spent as much time on. So take a look at this diagram and see if from this you can figure out um, the function of both mitosis and meiosis. So mitosis is for cellular growth and repair, and meiosis is for the production of gametes or sex cells. 
So these functions have real big implications on what we want those end cells to be like. For mitosis, because we're aiming for growth and repair, we want the end cells to be exactly the same as the starting cells. For the meiosis, for the production of gametes, we want those cells to actually have half the information of the original cells. And the reason is because it's going to take two gametes to combine to create one new organism. So we want to have just half the information um, from the coming from the egg and half the information coming from the sperm in order to create um, a full set of genetic information in the new offspring. So let's see what this means in terms of the number of chromosomes. So let's get to specifics here. How many chromosomes would you find in each of these highlighted cells? So in the cells of the adult and in the cells of the baby and in the cells of the fertilized egg, the zygote, we would find 46 chromosomes, at least in most cases. Um, the only cells where we're going to find a different number of chromosomes is in the gamete. So the gametes are the sex cells, the egg, and the sperm, and each of those has half the genetic information. So the female essentially picks out half of her uh, genetic information and puts that in an egg. Um, the male picks out half of his genetic information, puts it in the sperm, and then those two combine to create a full set of 46 chromosomes for the new offspring. So follow-up question here, before we get into um, the division step of meiosis, there's a step that takes place um, before mitosis and before meiosis, um, before the division processes. What is that? So the step that takes place before division in meiosis or mitosis is DNA replication. We'll get into the details of DNA replication in a later unit, um, but for now you need to be aware of um, some terms. So reminder that a chromosome is um, a unique uh, piece of um, information. Um, so you have homologous chromosomes that carry similar information, but it's not identical. So every chromosome is uh, unique. When you have replication, you're going to end up with two copies of each of those chromosomes. So in humans, if we have 46 chromosomes, when it has replication, we're going to then have uh, 92 chromatids. Let's see what that might look like. Okay, so on the left we see our somatic cell before DNA replication, and on the right we see the karyotype of the somatic cell after replication. So in both of these I want you to answer how many chromosomes are there and how many chromatids are there. On the left, this is a normal typical somatic cell. This is how most of your body's cells are in most of the, the time. Um, there are 46 chromosomes, and each chromosome has just one chromatid. So that's a total of 46 chromosomes, 46 chromatids. On the right, this is after DNA replication, which again occurs right before mitosis or meiosis, we now have extra chromatids. So we still only have 46 chromosomes, but now each one of those has two chromatids. So we have 46 chromosomes, and 92 chromatids. So now let's see what happens in mitosis and meiosis. So for both processes, mitosis and meiosis, what is the end result and what's the process, the overall general process that allows us to get there? So for mitosis, the end result is a somatic cell. So we want to end up with a cell that has 46 chromosomes and 46 chromatids. In meiosis, the end result we're going for is a gamete. So in a gamete, we want to have 23 chromosomes and 23 chromatids. So how do we get there? What's the process that we get from an after-replicated um, karyotype, like what we see in the middle there? How do we get from that kind of cell to the cells shown on the left and the right? So for mitosis, we just have to do one step of division that separates out those sister chromatids. For meiosis, we need to separate out the chromosomes and the chromatids. So this is going to take two steps. And that's why we call it meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, are the two major divisions of meiosis. We can see those two major divisions of meiosis in this diagram. You can see in the first step of meiosis 1, it separates out the homologous chromosomes. So we go from having 46 chromosomes and 92 chromatids to having 23 chromosomes and 46 chromatids. And then we do another division. In this case, we separate out the sister chromatids. So now we have 23 chromosomes and 23 chromatids. And we end up with four of those gamete cells. 
That's where we're going to leave it off for today. In the next video, we will talk about how some of these steps of meiosis lead to genetic diversity.